We are here to answer your game, gaming and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions is to get to us is to go through the website. That way they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we've got a question about licensed games from Danielle, better known as Major Kayla, here in the Bellhop lobby. There are lots of board games that come out linked to popular media, i.e. movies. What is the best and worst you've played? Now, we already talked about this specific question back on episode 60 of our podcast, our start of fall answer all AMA. So if you want to hear that answer, feel free to jump back there where we do talk about the best and worst games we've played. But I wanted to bring this one back up to look at from a different angle. Because over the last few weeks, and especially at our Extra Life event, I found myself playing a lot of licensed games, more than usual, like a whole bunch in a short period of time, which is kind of strange to me. Uh, these are games based on intellectual properties that are outside the board game world. Now, this includes the latest Minecraft game, Jaws the Board Game, and Horrified, Universal Monsters. It's a cooperative game. All of these come from Ravensburger. Now, I've also been playing Cthulhu Death May Die quite a bit, which, well, technically under public domain, so it's not a licensed game, but I like to think of the Lovecraft mythos as falling kind of under the same umbrella as licensed games. Now, what makes these game plays stick out to me is that all of those games were good. Maybe not necessarily great, but they were good. And this is something that's becoming more and more common with licensed game, which is amazing. But for a long time, at least in the board game industry, this was not the case. It used to be that I was honestly like, terrified. I would not touch a game if it used an established brand or intellectual property. Like that just meant it was going to be a bad game. And rightfully so. More often than not, historically, licensed games meant slapping a fresh coat of stickers on some old mass market standard like Barbie Twister, Grey's Anatomy Operation, or G.I. Joe Gin Rummy. Or if it was a unique game, it generally would have a roll and move or a spinner aspect, and maybe you draw some cards with pictures from whatever the license was in it. Or if, they, if it wasn't just a knockoff of another game, it was just a terrible excuse for a game, a bunch of mechanics thrown together just there to keep people's... Like, you're selling the, 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 the name, not the game. Yep. Now, the angle I want to take today is to actually talk about what makes for a good licensed game. What makes these games I played recently great? And then we're going to follow up with what I think are, I think I've got 12 of the best licensed games on the market. And none of them have a trouble bubble in the middle of the board. No. <laughs> Though there was someone on Etsy that was selling D20s and stuff and trouble bumbles. Since I lost G+, I don't know where I'd be able to find that person. But yeah, I, I would totally play a game if I had a Trouble Bubble, and it wasn't just a D6 in there. But but I have to say, I, I think that Trouble is probably one of the most licensed games oh, ever. Oh yeah, it's I up mean, there. Everyone it's, it's has slapped there. their their name on Trouble. I, I actually there. I, I'm lying, because I said I'd play it with anything but a D6 in there, but there's an R2-D2. There's a Star Wars one that has the, the D6 with an R2-D2. Oh, but of course, okay. there's no mechanic. It's just there's an R2-D2 in there, too, that bounces around with the die. All right, so what exactly is it that makes today's modern licensed games so much better than the drivel companies were serving up in the past? We're going to look at a few things that I think make the games better. So the first thing I think you need is the right license. For a licensed game to be successful, first off, people have to care about what that license is. Now, the most recent modern example I can see where this failed completely is the series of Atari games that came out. These came out over the last couple of years. Think Geek was really pushing them for a while. They were from IDW games, and there was Centipede, Missile Command, and Asteroids. I, who, like, okay, Atari's cool. Retro gaming is cool, but who cares about Missile Command or Centipede? Like, Asteroids, maybe. Maybe Asteroids, I don't know. Not enough people care about these old games. Now, Buffalo Games was smart, and just this year put out a Pac-Man game. Now, Pac-Man's got some hype. That's a brand people care about. That's a name people know. Yeah, it's one of those really strange choices. Just because it's old, and even if it was a fun game at the time, I mean, Centipede and Asteroids got a ton of arcade time. I mean, those games made yeah. furious, uh, huge money, but they didn't have story and, and buy-in other than the fact that the mechanics of that game were fun to play in the arcade, whereas Pac-Man had 
license and property yes. and there was something to pac-man i mean he had tv shows TV and things shows. uh it was you know it was a huge brand uh and so it really you really do have to be careful what it is you're thinking about when you get a license just because it's a property doesn't mean it's got anything behind it to make right. sales so having the right license can actually be enough to sell in a game on its own. This is basically what companies have gone off on for, for years, right? That's where all these bad games came out. I've got a friend who just dropped money, Wayne Humphrey, the Star Wars guy, I'm going to call him out, who bought the Star Wars Han Solo card game just because it was a Star Wars game he didn't own. He now regrets that decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's... Uh... I, again, I, I did the exact same thing with Minecraft, to be honest. I mean, we yep. have the Minecraft board game. We've talked about it on previous episodes. It's horrible. Hard it has game. not made it back a card game. It has not made it back to the table since that first day. Yeah. I remember buying a Harry Potter, the golden snitch card game that had a mechanic that was if you had the golden snitch card in your hand at the end of the game, you won, which totally invalidated the whole point in playing the game because all that mattered was who had this one card in their hand at the end randomly. Well, like, to be to be fair, that's actually yeah. <laughs> that okay, actually works with time. Quidditch. Yeah. I mean, thematic time. Uh, it's it's thematic. It's just I mean, Quidditch is a pretty bad game in that way too. Yeah, so you true. know, and to be honest, we're about to get to that point. So there you go. It, <laughs> it has our next step. But before that, um, the other thing a good license can do for a game, though, that is a good thing, is it can bring attention to a game that might have been missed. We spend a lot of time since having Daniel Zayas on the show. That was pretty much the, he was the one that, that, that opened our eyes to the number of games published every year. And this is now a year ago. There is an insane number of board games released each year. And it's impossible to play them all. It's actually impossible to keep track of them all anymore. Like even if you read every blog post, listen to every podcast, there's going to be games that slip under the radar. Having a known name on the cover of your game could get people to try your game that might have otherwise overlooked it. Like, put it this way. If you put out a new Star Wars game, everyone's going to be talking about it because there's a new Star Wars game. It's a way to draw people towards the game. And it's also a way to get people into tabletop, hobby tabletop gaming, right? To get people to play hobby board games versus your usual Monopoly games. Like a video game license could attract video game players to try their first hobby game. Or a movie-based game could get a family member to put Trivial Pursuit down for the night and actually play that new Walking Dead game because they love the series. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, you look at even games uh, that I, I think don't necessarily need um, theming. Uh, we talk about a specific D&D &D game all the time that I think is a really great game uh, yeah. that I'm sure a lot of people would never have played if it wasn't covered in D&D in &D stuff, uh, even though I don't think it, any of it needs it. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't have come to it without that D and D branding. Yeah, which actually does lead well to our next section because this doesn't happen in that game. Because the next thing I think a good licensed game needs is that the theme needs to come through in the actual play of the game. Now, this is where all those older licensed games fail. This is where the Monopoly games fail. Well, one of the ways they fail. People play licensed games so that they can feel like they're taking part of that thing, that thing they love. If you play a Star Wars game, you want to feel like you're a band of rebels fighting against an evil empire, or you want to feel like you're behind the helm of a starship or exploring the galaxy trying to find the rebel base. You're not playing Star Wars to roll doubles, move twice, and possibly buy a hotel on Tatooine. Yeah. <laughs> when you're playing a game about X, you better be doing things related to X. If it's a Minecraft game, you better be mining or crafting something or both. If it's a Battlestar Galactic game, I better be wondering who's the Cylon. If it's a Harry Potter game, there should be lots of spells and teamwork required. For a license game to be good, it needs to tie into that license and more than name alone. The more things that make you feel like you're part of whatever imaginary world is being sold on the box, the better. Macho72 says he wants to feel like a Jawa. I don't, don't know if there's too many games that'll give you that feeling. Well, there, you should, there should, someone should totally make a Star Wars Jawa scrap collector game where I, you yep. build bots. I, One I'm, of the most popular yeah. Star Wars play sets of all time was, I don't Jawa, know where they, yeah, yeah. the but crawler. Was the Jawa build a bot set, which I yeah. had, was worth a ton of money. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I mean, so oftentimes they, they try. I mean, I, I there are times when I will give them 
the attempt. They fail miserably, but I will give them an <laughs> attempt. And I'm going to go back to trouble here because at some point, somebody at some Christmas gave us a copy of the Frozen Trouble. And I'm sorry, it's trouble. But they actually went to the trouble where if you hit that one spot where you cross over the board, there was an avalanche. You know, they they tried. Right. They actually tried to, to squeeze it in there. It was desperate and it failed. But there was there was that that one horrible try for thing. And they had it broken up. So the four characters in the game were four of the main characters in the in the movie and all that. But, you know, again, it's just it's trouble. Right. Yeah. If you if you scrap if you scrape off all this the the the, the, the paint that, and, that, and that, stickers the theme comes through, but there's no mechanic tie in. Yeah. No, absolutely. You're just changing names, right? You're yep. pasting something on. And I have to agree. The game Sean was alluding to earlier is Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep's not on my list tonight because there is nothing in that game that has a D and D theme except for the words in the pictures. You are trading cubes for other cubes and then getting a set of cubes to trade in for a card. Like and the fact that it like nowhere. It doesn't have, what are your D&D tropes? You need to fight monsters, you need to collect treasure, you should go in a dungeon, and you should level up and gain experience and improve your character. You don't do any of those in Lords of the Waterdeep. Not a single one of those is in Lords of Waterdeep. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's got it's, the thing on there. And it's, uh, well, I mean, and part of it is it's the town management sort of thing. And that's, that's there is, I mean, what well, it's rogue management, but but there, yeah. there is there is a growing part of d and I think, where there's a little more of that economic aspect yeah. for some in some parties but no i mean i even i'm stretching here to, yeah. to try you're, 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 and squeeze it in and i don't think that it was there i don't think it was there in the first place yeah so up next one of the things that i think makes for a good game is the license doesn't matter now i realize this sounds like i'm contradicting my first part where i said you need the right license but what i mean here is the game should appeal to players despite its license the license should be the icing on the cake, the thing that makes the game even more appealing than it already is. It should be the thing that may draw in new people to hobby and get fans excited, but you shouldn't be something that needs, you shouldn't need to know the license. You shouldn't have to love the license to like the game. Yeah. Like if you have something like Catan, uh, Game of Thrones, you know, Catan is a great game. And if you can bring people to that game with a Game of Thrones tie-ins and it where it mm -hmm. works, you get the Warriors on the Wall or whatever the whatever your actual tie-in is, that can really work. But, you know, if you've got something that's just literally slapping stickers on top of your board of trouble. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty <laughs> much it. Because you shouldn't need a great license to sell your game because a good license game still has to be a good game. The actual gameplay and mechanics are the most important part of any board game. How fun is the game to play? How engaging is it? The level of player agency and interaction. All of the things that separate a good game from a bad game still apply when you throw a license on the game. Solid gameplay is what is going to get players wanting to play your game and play it more than once. What's going to get gamers talking about it and spreading the word. You can't have a good licensed game without it being a good game in the first place. A good game is going to appeal to all kinds of gamers. It's going to get the podcasters and the reviewers talking. It's going to get ranked up on Board Game Geek. It's going to get gamers excited to play it, regardless of the fancy name or logo or character that appears on the box. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where there there can be some trickery involved too. And, un, and unfortunately, sometimes I think this is going to catch people out. Uh, and she games rightly references Labyrinth in the chat room. Um, you know it. It had potential. It had miniatures that were gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It had a really winning license. I mean, you, if you've got the Labyrinth license, you've got a whole lot of buying power in your fingers. And again, the miniatures are gorgeous. No question. Mm -hmm. But then they completely failed on the make it a game aspect. So completely failed. And so like, I think uh... until people got it on the table they could generate a massive amount of buzz and drive mm -hmm. a lot of purchases prior to the first person getting it on the table and getting the review out there saying, oh mm -hmm. my God, this is horrible. Uh, and, and really, I mean, in a horribly nasty way, if they had paid a couple of reviewers who, because we all know there are reviewers out there who will take money and mm -hmm. we aren't one of them. And that's one of the reasons we are, we are rich and don't have multi-camera setups. Uh, but no, uh, there are reviewers out there who will take money for for reviews. And if they paid a couple of reviews, they could have driven the market up even more. Uh, I don't think they did at that 
uh, and I'm not not accusing I, anyone if of they anything. Did do that, I didn't. See it. But uh, you know, that's one of those things where if you can, you know, there there's ways to game the system. If you can make it good enough with a strong enough uh, property, you know, you can you can get a whole lot of copies sold before everyone figures out that you've made utter trash. Yeah. And and unfortunately, that same company got multiple licenses, including the Dark Crystal as well, which hurts because that's another game that just could have been so good could do so many things with that all right so those are the things i think are needed for a good licensed game you need a good license you need uh the theme needs to be tied the mechanics need to be tied to that license the two need to work together i should be seeing that license in more than just the pictures and the stickers and the, the card text and that license shouldn't necessarily matter the, the game should still stand on its own without that license because it still has to be a good game. No, absolutely. So now that we've talked about what makes a good licensed game, what are some of the best licensed board games out there? All right, this is going to be our usual unranked list. These aren't in any particular order except for the order they came up in my brain when I was writing the show notes earlier today. Uh, these are some of the best licensed game I played. No, I have not played them all. I know there are other licensed game out there that have huge fans, and I would love to know at the end of this, especially from our chat room, what games I missed, which games haven't I played. For example, there are some big name games out there that are recently released. There's a big Marvel game that just came out everyone's talking about. I haven't gotten to try those. So the, again, these are just the games I played, and these are the best out of my personal collection of games. Up first, one Sean has even played, and that is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Now, we got this one for our kids who are huge Potterheads. Uh, besides being a very solid deck builder, this has some great thematic elements. You play through a campaign, unlocking more books as you finish each one. Direct tie-in right there to Harry Potter, a series of books, right? Players are all students. They have to cooperate and defeat the forces of darkness together. Players spend most of the game building their own decks filled with spells, items, and allies from the wizarding world. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, we've talked about this many times. We don't need to go on. Uh, I think I've always said it's a very solid game. Uh, if anything, they they up the difficulty on it a hair too much, especially when you move into the uh, the first expansion for it. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, you can manage that. Uh, you know, as a gamer, you can you can you can learn to balance your own own games. Uh, if anything, the only real suffering point in this game is the lack of um, ability to whittle down your deck um, and, yeah. and eliminate cards from it, uh, which does, again, they did actually add that in in the, in the expansion, but doesn't exist at all in the first, uh, the main portion of the game. So and again, that was Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. All right, up next, I'm kind of cheating here because I said I was probably only going to give 12 games, but I'm going to lump these together. It's the Fantasy Flight Star Wars games because if I didn't lump these together, this would be a list of like 20 games because Fantasy Flight has been knocking it out of the park with their Star Wars license. And for years now, like they just keep putting out more and more awesome Star Wars games. Now, three in particular stood out to me. Rebellion, which is a two or four player game that many people are calling Star Wars in a box. It's basically you are playing through the original trilogy. One team's playing the Empire, trying to find the Rebel base. The other are playing the Rebels, trying to not be found and take out the bad guys. You, Everything that's in the movies is in this game. X-Wing is one of the best dogfighting skirmish war games out there that is just so much cooler because you're flying X-Wings and you can fly Boba Fett Slave 1. And then we mentioned so many times on the show Imperial Assault. One of the best one versus many dungeon delving board games out there that it also includes a great two player skirmish miniature game and happens to be Star Wars, which is a license I think everyone knows I dearly love. Yeah, no, it's hard to go wrong with Star Wars, uh, especially with the with Mo. Um, yeah. You know, I don't think you got the card game that uh, uh, you, you, you talked about earlier. But other than that, you've probably got uh, most of them out there. Yeah, I do have a lot of fantasy flight star wars games yeah so again yeah that was the fantasy flight star wars games as a general topic yes i don't know otherwise i could talk about more right there's the dice one that was pretty good but that one doesn't tie in the theme really to me at all the 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 duels so it doesn't belong on the list there's uh the card game i have one of the card games a living card game where it's double-sided there are just so many all right up next star trek ascendancy 
if Rebellion is Star Wars in a box, Ascendancy is Star Trek in a box. Explore a strange new worlds, seek out new life and new civilizations, and boldly go where no one has gone before. Unless you played the game enough times, you've seen all the systems that can come up. Uh, this is a great asymmetric game that plays very differently depending on which faction you play. Each faction's mechanics are tied thematically to the matching race in the Star Trek universe. The game lets you play the base game, lets you play Federation, Klingons, and Romulans, with expansions adding even more factions. This has all the exploration or all the battles or all the converting. There is all kinds of stuff going on here, all really well tied in. You're exploring the map. It changes every game. Lots of card-based randomization. Very cool Star Trek game. Yeah, no, again, Star Trek is another one of those properties where the fans are diehard. And if you make a good game that can really engage those Star Trek fans... Uh, and, and give them some meat. And again, Star Trek fans do tend to be a uh, intelligent group mm -hmm. in general. So if you make them something garbage, they're going to notice. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is it is not going to, you're not going to slip by with some haphazard Star Trek uh, stuff out there. Because uh, again, while Star Wars, you could argue, you know, a little bit of, of uh, blaster battling is fun. Uh, Star Trek is is a very thinking man's show. Mm -hmm. I mean, they it's it's all about that sort of uh, negotiation uh, and and things. So you can't just build a whole game around shoot 'em up uh, and call yeah. it a Star Trek uh, and and really have fans take you seriously at all. And Star Trek is a license that is notorious for having bad games, and many of them, including many modern ones, it's a, it's still rough trying to find a good Star Trek game nowadays. Well, it's it's a tough it's a tough balance. I mean, there's there's because it's hard. It's easy to do combat in a in a game. You know, mm -hmm. there's a million ways to do combat in a game. But doing interplanetary negotiations and and things like that are is a little tougher to to find a way through. Uh, but that was Star Trek Ascendancy. All right, up next, another fantasy flight game. I guess they're the ones that seem to get all the good licenses nowadays. Uh, game of Thrones, uh, specifically the second edition, though I'll admit I played the first. Second edition is what's available on the market now. Uh, this is a folk on a map game all about controlling Westeros. Up to six players each take on the role of a great house of the Seven Kingdoms vying for control of the Iron Throne. Now, this was released long before the popular TV series. So this game is all about the books and the, the characters from the books, which I assume are the same characters, but like the events are more tied to the books than the TV series. It includes all the warfare and diplomacy you'd expect from a Game of Thrones games. Mechanically, the neat bit here is you're assigning orders to your units in secret, which will remind some people of a classic Avalon Hill game. So you never know when that ally is going to backstab you, which is pretty much inevitable in this game. People talk about diplomacy ruining friendships. I've actually seen it happen with Game of Thrones at one of our public play events. Well, you know what? This is one of those games where you don't have to worry about the showrunners slacking off and killing the last season uh, yeah. because this does nothing to do. This is George R.R. R. Martin content. Yeah. We don't have to worry about what some writer's room <laughs> did to our uh, fandom uh, and we can enjoy Game of Thrones as it was meant to be enjoyed. Again, that's the Game of Thrones second edition. All right, up next, I've got Battlestar Galactica. Now, this game is the perfect example of a great game that happens to have a theme that makes it shine even more. Because I first played Battlestar Galactica only knowing the series from the 1970s, which I did love. Uh, the owner of the game had to explain to me that Cylons could now be disguised as humans and kind of the overall plot of these humans not knowing who's who and all this stuff. I had no clue who these characters, why, and who, why I should care that Boomer could be a sympathizer or whatever. I still had a great time. It was actually the game in this case that got me to watch the series. And then returning to the game after watching the series, I'm like, ooh, the game's even better because now I get some of those interactions. But it was fantastic the first time playing it without even knowing the license. Now, one big warning on this game, because we have seen it a couple times, make sure the players know that the game doesn't necessarily follow or match the series. And the fact someone's a Cylon in the show doesn't mean they're necessarily a sign in the game. Because this is a long game. It is not a short one. You're looking at three to five hours gameplay. Finding out five hours in that someone's not playing correctly can be a horrible experience. Yeah, in some ways, it's almost a shame that uh, the game is 
as tightly linked with the show as it is because yeah. it's again with gamers uh, and and you know people who are gamers tend towards role playing and you 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 have that feeling you want mm -hmm. to to role play you, you want know, to play you've the got character. this character you want to do that you know if you know the show if you're a fan of the property of the license then you have that connection and you don't want to necessarily ruin it for you uh and yet you can ruin the game for everyone if yeah. you if you choose to go that way uh, it's, but it's mostly people not quite understanding that it's not a play the character it's yeah, not a role playing game it's not a role playing game at all yeah absolutely uh, and that was Battlestar Galactica. All right. Up next, I've got StarCraft, the board game. Now, you're not going to find this one on the market now, I got to admit. Uh, if you do, you're not going to want to pay what it costs nowadays. This is one of the first good Fantasy Flight licensed board games going way back. This is one of those original huge coffin boxes that you could bury someone in. And it's still one of the best asymmetrical games ever made. And it's also one of the earliest games to use deck building. It's an area control game, folk on a map, tons of miniatures featuring the three major factions from the video game. And it includes two versions of each, which actually uses some of the Brood Wars stuff. So you can play up to six players. The units in the game act and are used in similar ways to their digital counterparts. So you can un unleash a Zergling Rush to try to take down those difficult to breach proto shields. But make sure you hurry up, because if you give the humans too much time, they're going to update their decks too much with technology cards. Yeah, and this is not, I mean, uh, you, you can't get it, you can't really get it these days anyway, but it's not an easy game, uh, no. it's not a short game, and it's, uh, but it is well liked. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's not one of those games that's got, uh, you know, massive ratings, but no. uh, it's a solid, you know, it's a solid game. It's one of those, it's one of those games that, that sort of sl slots into that, there's a whole lot of people who like it, and there's probably a lot of people who have no interest in it because of its weight. Um, uh, plus a lot of people that just couldn't get it because that was going back to almost the Catan days, right? Like people didn't know to buy a Starcraft board game back then or who yeah. Fantasy Flight was, right? Yeah. It, it, it's part of an accessibility of that game issue. And unfortunately they lost the license. They did try to re-put this out as a Warhammer 40k game, but it is significantly different. And that's Forbidden Stars, which personally, I guess Warhammer 40k is you can consider a license, but I kind of, to me, that's still in the same tabletop world. Right. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where StarCraft, you know, it it, it had its moment, but yeah. it doesn't have the same sort of staying power as the World of Warcraft um, uh, or Warcraft uh, licenses, I don't think. I think, you know, a lot of people probably aren't as familiar with StarCraft That's anymore true. because it, it faded away, whereas World of Warcraft just keeps coming back and won't yeah, go true. away. Well, StarCraft basically got replaced by League of Legends. Right. And that, that whole MOBA yeah, idea yeah. and that concept. Actually, to be honest, what could be on this list is the World of Warcraft board game, which is another huge box game uh, that tied in pretty well. But I only played it once, so and I don't own a copy, so I didn't want to talk too much about that. Personally, I, I remember preferring StarCraft at the time. And that was StarCraft, the board game. All right, going from something really old to something brand new. Uh, up next, I've got Minecraft Builders and Biomes. This is a new Ravensburger board game that does a rather good job of tying in just enough things from Minecraft into its mechanics to make you know that it's a Minecraft game while still being a rather solid set collection game on its own. Now, I particularly like the way they tied in the mining of bricks and the, of the various resources into the game. Something about that to me, it looks pixelated. That kind of cinched it for me. Now, I got to admit, it lacks the crafting element. It's a big part of the digital version, but no other Minecraft game has that yet either. So at this point, this is the best Minecraft game out there so far. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but uh, it's solid a solid game. Uh, and, and I have to say, I really recommend it to uh, the majority of people. Uh, and again, that was Minecraft Builders and Biomes. All right, next, another Ravensburger game that's Horrified. This, in Horrified, you're moving around town trying to collect items to help you defeat the Universal Studios Universal Monsters. Uh, the game that's out now includes Dracula, the Werewolf, the Creature from the Black Lagoon, the Mummy, the Invisible Man, Frankenstein's Monster, and Frankenstein's Bride. And the two of those actually work as a team. Each monster has its own set of rules, and the gameplay changes depending on which monster you face. The theme is pretty well integrated here. 
like for example of that, you're going to collect red items to try to destroy Dracula's coffin. Well, red items are weapons, so you need weapons to destroy Dracula's coffins. But once you do, you're going to need yellow items of sufficient power to defeat the Count. Now yellow items are mystical items. And I like the way that, despite just being a bunch of tokens, they did some good work in tying those together. Yeah, no, it's absolutely... The, the theme in this game is really strong. Uh, they've got a fantastic license. I mean, you can't really go wrong with Universal Monsters unless you're making certain movies, but we won't talk about those. <laughs> uh, but as a okay. concept, as a property... Uh, it's a great license, and they were smart. They didn't tie themselves to any of the films in any way. Mm -hmm. They did their own art. So they have they have sort of removed themselves from any successes or failures of the film universes uh, in order to stand alone with the property and the concepts of monsters. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're even very smart. They outright say in several portions of the, of the uh, rule book, we know the name of the creator was Frankenstein, but ah, yes, it's easy. The easiest way to refer to them is in a group of monsters Frankenstein is Frankenstein's monster. Bride. So yes. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's bride is how it uh, and Frankenstein's monster's bride is how it comes out. So they 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 even cover that standard argument. It's not uh -huh. Frankenstein. It's the you know they covered that. It's all in there. Um, really really strong strong theme. You it and again a powerful license. And that is Horrified by Ravensburger. Next up, another deck building game, Legendary Encounters Alien. Uh, this deck builder is based on the Marvel Legendary card game, but twists things up by making it a purely cooperative game. Hey, squad of Marines versus a bunch of aliens. We should work together. Now, to enhance this squad feel of the game, this includes a new mechanics and cards that let you help out other players by giving people bonuses when it's not your turn then toss in a hidden movement system to get that feel of not knowing what's around the corner, and then toss in, finally, a timing mechanic where if you don't act quick enough, the queen or the main baddie's gonna win to up the tension. I love that. I love the fact that, that all of those things to me say aliens, and it's great. Then you got a bonus that the core box actually includes different scenarios and strategies you can use that let you play through various movies in the Alien series all in one box, and you've got a winner for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, Aliens, another strong content. It's been going for years. Uh, everyone is aware of the Aliens uh, properties from Alien all the way to the newer Prometheuses, like them or hate them. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's one of the things, one of the things I love about deck builders, and one of the, one of the reasons why they're sort of my go-to is they are just so flexible. I mean, if you really take the time to craft them correctly, uh, you really can evoke a whole lot of emotion and tension and cooperation and things in that game. Uh, so uh, that was Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. All right, Charles Frank was in the chat. Thank you for joining us, Charles. We just got to the game you were asking about. That is Firefly from Gale Force 9. Here's a big map of the galaxy showing all kinds of interesting planets and ports of calls. Each has a themed deck filled with interesting contexts, contracts, jobs, some legal, some no. Oh, here on the edge of the space, there's a reaver ship. Watch out for that. In the galactic center is the Alliance. You don't have to worry about them unless you do something illegal. You wouldn't do that, would you? You're a captain. You got a ship. Time to find a crew and go. Like, I don't think anyone could have done a better job of capturing the feel of Firefly than Gale Force 9 did with this game. Like, it's it's there. Everything you wanted from Firefly is there. Uh, again, not, we, we need to start a list. One that I should probably get to the table when I'm down there. <laughs> um, huge Firefly fan, again, and it, diehard fans. Uh, they managed to, you know, scrape up a movie when, when it was dead. <laughs> uh, it, you know... And unfortunately, other than things like this, we will never have more Firefly. Uh, Joss, yeah. has, Joss has said outright that um, we're not getting more. So uh, uh, games there's, like... There's, they're still doing comics and expanding the universe yeah. through comics. But, uh, but you know, this is, this is a way where you can relive some of those feels from, uh, from, the, from the show, from the movie, uh, and, and, you know, keep it going. And that was uh, Firefly from Gale Force 9 Games. All right, this one I wasn't sure if I should put it on the list, but I put it on for one specific reason. This is Pillars of the Earth. 
And I did this because everything else we talked about are big blockbuster things with movies and TV series you can see on the screen and everyone's talking about them. Some games are based on books and books alone. Pillars of the Earth is an excellent medium heavy Euro all about building a cathedral in medieval Europe based on the Pillars of the Earth series of books from Ken Follett. Characters and events from the book are represented by random events and crew cards. So while playing the game, you flip on an event and it'll be stuff that happened in the books. Now, it may not be tied to the license as much as the other games. I did want to include an example of a great game based on a little lesser known license. So this actually was a TV show as well. Oh, uh, my wife okay. my wife was a huge fan of it. Uh, I never really got into it. Uh, but yeah, no, this was uh, Ian McShane, Eddie Redmayne, Haley Atwell. It was, uh, it was actually a, a miniseries right. in 2010 uh, that did quite well. Um, uh, not well enough for me to have heard of it. Well, there you go. Uh, so yeah, uh, just if you, if you like Pillars of Earth and didn't know, there is a t uh, miniseries from uh, 2001 that's got an 8.1 on IMDb, actually. It's, oh, that's it's not quite bad. well rated. Uh <sighs> And uh, well, apparently, uh, Ancient Games is saying the board game is a series as well. Yes. So yeah, there there are multiple games. There's also a Column of Fire, and there's also a two player Pillars of the Earth called something. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. I haven't played those. I own Pillars of the Earth. Actually, really neat game that does some neat stuff with worker placement, where you don't know what order your workers are going to come out. You pull them out of a bag, and then if you want, you can pay to put your put yours back in to get pulled out later. It does some neat stuff that other games haven't done. It's it's a very solid euro with a theme that happens to tie in. Right. This is one where I prefer the game without knowing the theme that well. <laughs> All righty. And All that right. was uh, Pillars of Earth. Up next is another classic, which I have no idea if you can still get, but it was my favorite collectible card game back in the day, and that is Middle Earth the Wizards. Now, this is long out of print. Um... You are playing one of the Ashtari, the wizards from Middle Earth. Yes, Gandalf and all those, but includes all the, the ones you may not know of unless you've read all the books or the Silmarillion. You're wandering around Middle Earth, forging alliances, recruiting allies into your fellowship, trying to boost your strength to be able to fight Sauron's army. Uh, this game was tied heavily to the books it was based on and included some really, for a card game, complex quests to get the best cards in the game. Like you would have to go to Rivendell to get Narsil, the broken blades. And then you would have to go recruit a, the right dwarf to fix it. Then you would have to go to the forge and play your dwarf and your Norso card to get Glamdring. And I'm probably getting all the names wrong here. Cause it's been a long time since I played, but like there would be these multi-step things just to be able to play the one card. That's worth a lot of points. It was nasty and neat. And it felt like you were, on a quest and on an adventure, you were moving around Middle Earth and having to do all these things. And then another really neat aspect is only half your deck was doing that. The other half were hazard cards that you put in your deck to play against your opponent. Then, of course, there was sticking with the themes. There was another way to win the game. Instead of going around Middle Earth and doing all this work, all you had to do was play the one ring card at the same time your fellowship is at Mount Doom and you won. But this was a collectible card game, and I still don't know anyone that owned of the One Ring card. I was never able to find one. Well, and that's one of those issues where you run into, and, you know, there's probably, there may only be one ring card. I, I doubt that. Uh, that'd be funny if there was only one. Um, <laughs> but that was the, uh, the CCG Middle Earth, The Wizards. All right. Uh, there you've got thoughts on what makes a good license game, as well as some examples of games I think do it right. Remember, not only does the license matter, but the mechanics better actually be tied to that license. And even more importantly, the game better just be a good game in the first place. What I want to know is what you think makes for a good license game. Let us know in the comments, online, on social media, or in our chat room. Well, we're checking back into the lobby. Uh, we've got some some good chat going on in there. Uh, Poncho mentions, uh, it just hit me as a chess player, I hate seeing a license slapped on a chess set. Think Simpsons oh. chess. Now, this I find interesting because while I get the license aspect doesn't really work, I mean, historically, your chess pieces have always had a theme. Um, you know, there, there's always been some sort of, of physical graphical theme to it um 
So, I mean, I can get while, yes, yeah, throwing the silly ones on it like Simpsons isn't. Um, but uh, what we consider the modern plain chess pieces are, aren't actually all that um, old, I don't think. Uh, actually, I'll have to look into that, but... Uh, also, uh, Poncho has mentioned uh, mechs and minions, since you mentioned uh, League of Legends. Uh, that's, a, that's a decent enough game. I like that one. Uh, the problem is I never played League of Legends to know if it tied in at all or how it tied in. So it, it may belong on this list. I don't know. It was a game that was good enough, but it wasn't good enough to make me go look for its source material. It's a solid game on its own, a cooperative programming game. What I liked in that is it did something different from Robo Rally. Robo Rally, your program wipes every turn and you make a new program, where your mechs and minions program stays there and it just keeps repeating turn after turn. So the game's actually not about writing a program, it's about improving your program as things change on the board, which I thought was really cool. Some of literally the best components ever produced for a board game ever, like they, they're, they, like they make Cthulhu Death May Die look like a bunch of crap. Like it, it is a really impressive game. Uh, as I said, I just, I don't know how well it ties to the, like, I don't know if League of Legends is about little goblin dudes in mech suits killing uh, little guys in red suits. I have no idea. It's it's a fun, you know what, I, I League of Legends, I, I tried it, I couldn't get into it because I couldn't get a team, and, and it's really one of those games where going in on your own is just asking for um, flame and, and hard hardship. <laughs> um, and uh, I, it wasn't necessarily my type of game anyway. But uh, yeah, no, I played it. And uh, from what I can understand, it, it there definitely is a, a strong linkage between right. uh, the mechanic and, and the game. And uh, we've heard some good things about it. Uh, other than that, we've had a few, uh, a lot of little chat going on between three things. Uh, Major Kayla mentions that Betrayal at Baldur's Gate is actually better than Betrayal at House on the Hill. I've heard that, but I, I dislike Betrayal at House on the Hill quite a bit. It's not that it's a terrible game. It's a terribly designed game that can be easily broken multiple ways, like just the dice come up wrong or people lose track of things or they read the book wrong. So I never even wanted to try the Baldur's Gate one, even despite being a D&D &D fan. I do wonder how much the D&D &D ties into that. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons is famous for having bad licensed games. Like, to be honest, uh, like D&D &D Clue has just been announced, a new version of D&D &D Clue, because there was one announced when 3.0 came out in 2000, um, they're like the 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 D and D adventure games are solid. I gotta say, um, Tyrants of the Underdark being one major exception. That game is good, and it ties in the theme good too because you've got a lot of drow stuff going on with the the promoting your people into your private house and sending out spies and assassinating people. I think that's a great example. But again, I didn't think I like I was thinking more established media properties when I wrote this. Whereas to me, D&D &D is tabletop gaming. Plus, my original thought when I started writing about this topic today was I was going to include RPGs as well. But I think there's enough to be said that we may save that as another topic. No, absolutely. And it'd be weird to talk about licensed D&D &D games when we're also going to be talking about D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah, D&D &D as a license. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's interesting. And uh, like one of the things uh, we, we didn't mention because we were, we were really going with recommendations here was, again, some of the bad stuff. And you mentioned Clue there. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I had that experience with Harry Potter Clue, where they just clutched it horribly. Uh, except apparently there is a, there is another Harry Potter Clue which does it right. So, you know, right. and 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 even just trying to separate which of them is the right one on Board Game Geek has been difficult. So, um, and I bet you have problems with people reviewing one thinking it's the other one. Absolutely, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, again, there's always that strange crossover on, on on both Board Game Geek and Amazon, even when they when they swap. Uh, so, uh, there we go. The Thunder Thunderbirds game is good. Uh, co by that. the Pandemic Guy. Yeah, I have heard Matt Leacock. I have heard that the Thunderbirds game is really good. Uh, the Ghostbusters game is not. <laughs> Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier should be good, but the component quality is bad. Um, I don't know. I, we, we, that's, that's why I didn't really want to get into the good and bad. I wanted, well, I did want to get into the good, but... There, there were, there are a lot of bad we could like uh, even yeah. in the hobby board game world, right? So we were talking about Star Trek games earlier. Uh, is it called Star Trek: The Final Frontier? It is basically roll for it. Is a dice game where you're just trying to get dice combos to take cards, and and the the really big deal is that you could play the next generation crew or the original crew and you can mix and match. But all it is is you get a character card and you can flip it over. Like <laughs> it, it, it's just oh, I, I think it's called First Contact. 
Now I'm forgetting what it's called. Star Trek. I don't look this one up. <laughs> it can't be First Contact. What is it? It was a roll and write game. Well, not a roll and write, but it's a dice game. Five Year Mission, Major Killer. So five, five Year, year mission. mission. There you go. Five Year Mission. One of, one of the biggest problems I have, and I think, and this oh. is actually, um, uh, Angie Games was joking about me buying uh, buying the the property, the the Harry Potter property, anyway. Um, and we didn't actually. Now that I now that I remember, uh, and it's one of the huge problems, and and one of the reasons that at least some of these horrible licenses work is, oh, I know you're a Harry Potter fan. I should go out and buy you a Harry Potter game. And, oh, yeah. the, the, you know, the relative or the friend or, you know, great aunt Edna goes out and buys mm -hmm. you this Harry Potter game because Harry Potter is good and here is a Harry Potter game. And mm -hmm. I know Clue is good, so Clue, this must be good. Right. Um, and I think so much of the money on these is made off of purchases just like that. I know what Clue is. I yep. know you like Harry Potter. This must be good. Well, that's um, it, yeah. And, and you know, that, it's that's, easy money for people who don't know. <laughs> that's part of why I'm glad the board gaming is becoming more mainstream and hobby board gaming in particular, and people are learning yep. that there are good games. And the fact that there are good licensed games, because that was the thing is, yeah, and Dune would be like, oh, it's it's Harry Potter and it's Clue. I have to buy it. Meanwhile, all us board gamers are like, oh, it's Harry Potter. I'm like, oh, that's probably going to be terrible because every licensed game is terrible. Yeah, no, I bitch kill is mentioning the Doctor Who uh, uh, skinned games. I'm like, I've got Doctor Who Yahtzee. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's all there. It's And it's so easy to just, again, slap the stickers on it. Um, yeah, I remember playing Dragon Ball Z Yahtzee with twos on her birthday. And I'm like, so what in this makes this Dragon Ball Z? And it just has all these symbols on it. And yeah. I'm like, well, how do you know what's a one, two, or three? And they're like, you don't. And I'm like, well, how do you know you have a a, yeah. a, 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 a Yahtzee, a, a series? Like, and I'm yeah, like, so what in this makes it Doctor Who? Or, yeah, or not, that, or and the worst Ball. part about the Doctor Who game was the, the shaker was a TARDIS, which is great. And it was, yeah, really, it was actually a really cool. nice TARDIS, except mm. they didn't bother to felt the inside. So oh, it geez. was so just crack, 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 oh. crack. I mean, it was loud, <laughs> like deafeningly loud like let's just wow. put the TARDIS on the table and we'll use our hands to shake the dice because we don't want to listen to that um it was, it was that I've painful. been really tempted to pick up uh Firefly Yahtzee because the the cups of Serenity and the Serenity is really nice oh yeah well or, sorry not thing. Serenity it's a yes yeah, Serenity is that the name of the shift wow yeah. oh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna pass on that it's been ages I'm yes I think. it must be Serenity Serenity has got to be the name of the ship it was a Firefly oh. class ship it's got to be named Serenity yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's one of those things where, um, uh, you know, they, they, they can, again, they're, they're trying to catch the eye of those people who don't know any better to buy yeah. it, uh, it's or, a, it's or collectors switch, who just want, right? like, again, I don't mind having the TARDIS ga game around or the, the Dr. Who Yahtzee around because the TARDIS is really nice. Like just having that TARDIS sitting on a bookshelf looks nice. Um, we just don't necessarily, you know, and if we want to play Yahtzee, we can pull the dice out and use them or just grab one of the thousands of D6 lying around the house. <laughs> yeah. I'm just... uh, but uh, yeah, so they're, they're, and again, it's one of those things where, yes, the hobby board games are getting into stores like Toys R Us has a lot of hobby games in it now. But the problem is it's still going to scare off, you know, Aunt Edna now, and Uncle Bob. Until um, that generation yeah. ages out, basically. And the next generation's like, I'm not buying that stuff anymore. Yeah. All righty.